Hey friends, Katherine Korostoff here, and today I'd like to talk about survey research. Now, I know in this series I typically talk about new research methods, new data sources, new career paths, and more for the market research and insights uh, profession, but I do want to talk about surveys too because surveys are great and I do still value the tried and true. Survey research isn't going away. Um, and the good news is, is that today there is more research on research about how to do survey research well than ever before. So if we really are going to keep doing survey research, we have an opportunity to really, really amp it up to do the best possible work we can possibly do because there's been so much research done on how to improve survey research in terms of the process and ultimately for data quality because that's what we care about. When we do survey research, we wanna feel really confident in our data quality. Now, there are many things that can impact data quality. And as a result, there's a lot of different research on research topics here. For today, I'm gonna to just focus on one of them, which is maximizing response rates. Now, for those of you who may be newer to the market research profession, you might ask, what is a response rate? And how do I calculate it? How do I calculate it? It's probably easiest if I just give you an example. Um, so imagine we're going to be doing an email survey and you email out 1,100 survey invitations, 100 bounce back, and 250 respond. So your response rate is simply 250 divided by the 1,000 people who you are actually able to successfully reach. So that would be a 25% response rate. So Again, super simple way to think about it is it's just how many people you're actually reaching and knowing how many people actually respond. So the math is simple. Now, 25% in our hypothetical example, what do you think? Is that good? Is that bad? For most of us researchers, that is amazing. Unless you're routinely doing employee research or research with some other specialty populations, a 25% response rate would be, you know, it's just not that common. Uh, so for most market researchers, this would be a very hypothetical example. But in any case, we always want to optimize that response rate, right? We want to get the highest possible responses, number of responses from our qualified participants. So it's super important and it's a great way to maximize the quality of our data, actually working on optimizing our response rates to our surveys. Whether we're doing that survey by email, phone, in-person, paper, what have you. So let me ask you a question. We all know that survey response rates are important to us, but how can you actually maximize your survey response rates? How many different levers can you pull to maximize response rates for your survey research projects? Can you think of two or three different things, maybe four or five? So it does vary a bit by population and data collection method. So if you're primarily doing B2B research, for example, you have some things that are kind of unique to what you need to do to improve response rates for B2B research. Um, and it can also vary by the data collection method. So there are certain things that are relevant for doing telephone data collection that helps to maximize response rates that it are a little bit different than online data collection. That aside though, there are still some common fundamental things that basically apply no matter what your data collection method is. Now, I'm going to talk about eight things that are pretty universal. These are eight things that really anybody who does survey research can be considering as opportunities to, again, pull the different levers and try to optimize response rates. Now, there is a lot more research on research out there. So for example, if you're somebody who does telephone data collection, the Pew Research Center publishes a lot of research on research on specifically telephone data collection, including response rates. Um, and there was one paper in particular I recommend, which was published in the um, published in May of 2017, again by Pew Research Center, and it was titled "What Low Response Rates Mean for Telephone Surveys." So a good example of research on research specifically for phone research. I definitely recommend it if that's something that you do a lot of. Um, but there are absolutely sort of these eight things that really apply to 
any kind across all data collection methods, uh, maybe skews a little bit towards online surveys, but really these are important considerations for all data collection methods. So let's take a look. So my first topic that I want to talk about is making sure that we are considering the relevancy of the topic or the sponsor. So as evidence of why this is so important, um, consider the value that we get when we can do a non-blind survey. That is, if I'm doing research for an automobile company and it's a situation where I can reveal the brand name when I'm doing the survey, then that does tend to get a higher response rate as opposed to coming from generic market research firm. Um, this is also important for those of you who do B2B research it's a fairly common trade-off to make in B2B research, where in some cases, the B2B population you're going for is really hard to reach, and you're willing to make that trade-off of, all right, I'm gonna reveal that the sponsor is XYZ brand um, in order to get the highest possible response rate that I can get. So we know that the relevancy of the sponsor is important. We also know that the relevancy of the topic is important. So across data collection methods, it's important that the topic is something that is going to resonate with people. They're going to want to respond. The second thing, of course, that's always important, incentives, right? The monetary or non-monetary things that we do in order to motivate people to participate. And there are a lot of different ways of doing incentives these days, but we do know that incentives count. Now, every once in a while, somebody will say to me, well, how about instead of doing incentives, how about I make charitable donations? I love that idea. And I know there have been some cases where it has worked. In my experience, and I have done this experiment several times over my career, unfortunately, promising people a donation uh, for a nonprofit doesn't get me the same response rates as, as being able to say, if you complete the uh, survey, then you are guaranteed to get a $10 gift card or whatever it is that I'm offering. So unfortunately, it doesn't work that great. There is an important exception though. If you're somebody who does research with government agencies or other types of organizations that are not allowed to accept gifts, the idea of donating to a charity may, be, may, may work for you. In other words, it may be better than nothing. So certainly worth doing an experiment if you are doing research with audiences that are not allowed to accept gifts. Um, and by the way, that is a real thing. <laughs> there are definitely government agencies where they have very strict policies about accepting any kind of gift, including survey invitations. And for people who do medical research, they know that this is a hot topic in the medical research world as well. The third thing to talk about is the survey duration, making sure that it is reasonable and also being honest about it. There's no bait and switching, right? Because we want to be honest with people, not only because it's the right thing to do, but because we want anybody who takes a survey to have a good experience. We don't want people to feel like survey researchers are all out to get them. They're going to, you know, really try to squeeze every last second of their time. We want to be really transparent so that they'll have a good survey experience and hopefully we'll accept future survey invitation offers. So we want to be really great about survey duration, being reasonable about it. And the big question then becomes, well, how long can I have my surveys? Again, it really varies by data collection method and population, and of course, to some extent, incentives. You will often see, for example, in certain categories where the surveys do tend to be longer, that they give higher incentives. So that, that kind of goes with, with the territory. Now, over the years, there have been a wide variety of studies on how survey duration is important to response rate. So if somebody knows that the survey is going to take 10 minutes, how will they, are they likely to respond? And then compare that to somebody who's been offered, a, or maybe that same person gets offered a five minute survey. Are they more likely to respond? Well, of course, people are more likely to respond to a shorter survey invitation, you know, the promise of a shorter survey than the the threat of a longer survey, I guess is, I might say. Um, but there, the thing is, is there have been numerous studies and basically the timeline keeps getting shorter and shorter. So like 15 years ago, our rule of thumb was anything over 15 minutes and you're starting to see a decline in response rate that's getting pretty steep. And these days now, it's somewhere between five and 10 minutes. Now, that is really specific to consumer research. 
There's some different things that happen in the B2B world, but certainly in consumer research, you'll find that there's a lot of research on research that suggests that once you get longer than five to 10 minutes, especially if your participants are generally taking your surveys on their mobile phones, on their smartphones, then after 10 minutes, you see a really steep decline in response rates. And so that's problematic. So we have to really be great about making sure that our surveys aren't onerous, that they have a reasonable length, um, and again, that we're transparent. Invitation text. The text that you use, the components, the things that you mention when you're asking people to participate is very important. And in fact, this is a huge topic. So I actually put together a few months ago a compendium of articles on research on research on this topic. And so I'll post a link to that compendium here in the comments. Um, I'll, I'll post it both on the YouTube program and on the iTunes program. Uh, so you can download that whole compendium and, and read the actual research summaries directly. Um, but the bottom line is that what the components are are really important. And some in some cases, the actual word choices can be super important um, in terms of how people respond. But again, this is one of those topics where it does somewhat vary based on data collection method. Still, I think you'll find that the compendium, even though it's really about email data collection, I think that you'll see that some of the interesting things, the interesting techniques that they, the research points to really can be applied to other data collection mo modes as well. A fifth thing that we can do is focus on personalization of the invitation. Personalization is a really hot topic in the world these days, right? Um, if you do any work in the world of marketing, you know that personalization is a huge topic. People expect a personalized experience. Um, they expect you to know things. Um, they expect you to leverage existing knowledge and surveys are no exception. So there's been some interesting research on research in this as well. So anything we can do to make that invitation feel personalized is really important. And if you are doing B2B research, you also have the opportunity to personalize not just with an individual's name, but with their company name or perhaps their job title. The next topic, reminders. Reminders are really effective. Uh, and what I mean by reminder is if you are inviting somebody to participate in research and they don't respond, then you want to send them a reminder. Um, and that might be delivered by, uh, by email. It might be delivered as a postcard. It might be delivered as a voicemail message if it's phone research. But some kind of reminder system can be really helpful. And many researchers will do two rounds of reminders. So let's say I'm doing a study and um, you know, I've started data collection and after three or four days, I might send out an email to my non-responders saying, hey, please don't forget the deadline's coming up. Would love to have your participation, make them feel really loved and give them a little bit of rah-rah. And reminders really do happen, do help. Um, you know, there's plenty of evidence on the efficacy of reminders and boosting response rates. In some studies, people have published that they get as many as half of their original data collection. So if on day one of data collection, let's say that first couple of days, let's say I get a thousand responses, I send out a reminder, I might get as many as another 500. Now, personally, my success hasn't been quite that high, but there have been research studies published that have reported that level of response to reminders. So clearly a great thing to do. Number seven, pre-contact. Uh, pre-contact is when I let somebody know I'm going to be inviting them to a survey. It's my warm-up call. It's my opportunity to let them know that they're very special and that I really want them to participate. And I'm really hoping that they, when they get the invitation in whatever mode they're gonna get it, that they will reply and that they will participate. And in some categories, this is really effective. Um, so for example, I've done this when I've done research with high net worth individuals. If you've um, ever done research with high net worth individuals, you know that they're a really tough group. Uh, they respond much better to phone surveys than online surveys. Um, and anything we can do to make them feel loved is important. And so that's a great example where I always would have some sort of pre-contact and have some sort of executive 
you know, have it come from some executive. If the research wasn't blind, absolutely an executive from the brand. If the research is blind, somebody else who's an executive, um, even at the research company, just so they can see that, you know, the CEO of, of XYZ Research is requesting blah, blah, blah. But anything I can do to show them that they're getting executive level warm up to the actual survey invitation, and it really can help. Um, so certainly if it's not something you've tried, I would recommend doing an experiment. You know, the next time you have a survey coming up, do a split sample, you know, let half get a pre-contact, half don't, and see whether for the populations that you're typically working with, whether or not you're seeing if it can be successful. And number eight is timing. So the nearly universal thing that we can do, no matter what our data collection or population is, um, if we are really careful about the timing, it can really help to maximize response rates. Um, we have to, timing means a couple of things. First of all, avoid being unreasonable. Don't ask people to comply to a paper survey within 24 hours, you know? Uh, don't ask people, to, don't send people an email invitation and tell them that the deadline is two days later. Um, that's considered unreasonable. That's just, you're asking people to do work and you're giving them a really tight deadline. So be careful about your timing requests. And of course, the other aspect of timing is that you do have to be careful about response rate variations by time of year. There's holiday issues, there's seasonality issues. In some countries, there are other, um, you know, sort of cyclical things that cause response rates in certain countries to be higher or lower at different times of year. And you have to be careful not to make assumptions. For example, many years ago, the first time I did research in Italy, got a little close to the holiday season, and it turns out that they take very long Christmas holidays in Italy, much longer than any other country I'd ever done research in. If I recall, it was like five or six weeks. So there was basically a five or six week window where we were not gonna get any data collection done. Um, so we have to be really careful about that sort of thing. All right, so let's see, what did we go through? So we went through eight ways to maximize the response rates. So again, just a summary, taking it from the top, relevancy of the topic or sponsor, incentives, survey duration, making sure it's reasonable and that we're being transparent about it, the invitation text itself. And again, I will post a link to my compendium in the comments section. Um, and then the personalization of the invitation, because we know personalization is really important these days. Um, reminders, pre-contact and timing. Well, I hope that was a good refresh for some of you. And for those of you who may be newer on your career path, maybe some of these were new ideas for you. I always tell people, refresh, right? If you haven't refreshed what you're doing with your surveys, think about, is there something I can do to refresh? Like if you've been using the same invitation text for five years, it's probably time to refresh. Um, I hope you found that all useful. Again, check out the link uh, that I'll post in the comments. And if you have any questions, please post them here, or you can also post them to me on Twitter at Research Rocks. If you did enjoy this conversation, please do like and subscribe either on YouTube or on iTunes. Reviews are especially precious to me. The more reviews I get, the easier it becomes for people to actually find the conversation series in their search engines. Um, so please do that, that would be awesome. And if you are planning any upcoming training, please visit training.researchrockstar.com to see our course options. We have courses coming up in data analysis, client management skills, Excel for survey data analysis, SPSS, ethnographic research, online qualitative, and more. And that's it, folks. Thank you so much, and I look forward to seeing you next week.